The good part about injuries in fantasy football, the good part about players having flop seasons is that your idiot league mates are going to think that these guys stink. They're going to forget all about them, and that's when you come in full force. I know I know your league mates. Listen, I know they're not putting the work in this summer. I know that their shirts ain't tucked in. I know the traps are not flexed. I know the plate is not full. But y'all are out here eating. Today we're going over six players in fantasy football that your idiot league mates are going to overlook because they're not prepping. They're not out here putting the work like you are. You should not be overlooking these guys. Not today. Not now, not never. 2023 fantasy football. We'll get it. The first dude up on this list is Calvin Ridley of the, I wish, Atlanta Falcons, but the Jacksonville Jaguars. I'm going to talk about him in a second, but I want to show you all something that is free money for you. Underdog right now has Pat Mahomes up for like the next three or four days. I'm not actually sure exactly when this expires at 0.5 passing yards. 0.5. All he's got to do is complete a pass in the first game of the season. So, so that square is in relation to the week one game, but it's only going to be up on Underdog for the next three or four days. They are taking it down. It's only for y'all, like I said, putting in the work for this summer. So when you're paying attention to us, when you're on the Underdog platform, they allow these free squares to rip off every now and then. And if you're not on top of it, if you're not watching us, if you're not subscribed to us, then you will not get this information. So Pat Mahomes, 0.5 passing yards. Do not let this expire. It is a free square for you to hit on underdog. If you are new to underdog, make sure to use these four letters when you sign up. In the promo code slot, BDGE will get you a 100% deposit match. Throw 20 down. You'll get 40 to play with, and you put it on Patty Mahomes, then you'll have 80 to play with. We love to see it. We love free money for each player. I'm going to break down why your idiot league mates are going to have overlooked them and then why you should not. So why they're going to overlook Calvin Ridley, this one's a little bit obvious. The guy went and hit some higher lowers himself on underdog. He probably used our promo code BG. Shout out to him. Unfortunately, the NFL ain't allowing that shit. So he got suspended, obviously, for the year. And prior to that, last time we saw him on the football field, wasn't exactly great, but if you've read the article, the blog post that Calvin Ridley wrote himself on the Players' Tribune, you'll understand why he was all mentally fucked up uh, during that season with the Falcons. So I would highly suggest going to read that article. We will link it down below. The Players' Tribune, the underdog link will also be down there. But I am extremely confident. I'm extremely confident that Calvin Ridley is going to have a, a an incredible bounce back with the Jacksonville Jaguars. Now, listen, uh, I, I understand if you're in the best ball streets, if you've been drafting on underdogs, you could draft actual fantasy teams on there. You haven't forgot about Calvin Ridley. He's going damn near like middle of the third round right now. But in most leagues and most normal leagues where you're not ripping drafts in April and May and June, Calvin Ridley is going to be a guy that regular people are kind of overlooking. And they're like, I don't really know. It feels risky. He was gone for a year. He's kind of old now. He's moving to a new offense. Like, that's why people aren't going to draft him. But I am overwhelmed with excitement about what Trevor Lawrence is going to do in another year added to this offense and the trajectory of this offense. I don't think, like, I understand they weren't high power and explosive. But at the end of the year, I, I want to read some like end of year finishes for this Jacksonville offense in what I felt like was kind of a mediocre year based on where Trevor Lawrence in his, his where Trevor Lawrence is in his career. I think he's about to enter that like elite prime mode of the prospect level we imagine him being coming into the NFL. Jacksonville in 2022, seventh in total yards per game, eighth fastest pace, ninth in points per game, ninth in yards per play. Ninth in pass attempts per game. Tenth in red zone scoring attempts per game. Tenth in passing yards per game. They're scoring a lot. They're racking up a lot of yards. They're moving fast. They're throwing the ball a lot. They're throwing for a lot of yards. That was their first year together in a new offense, and now you add Calvin Ridley to the mix. I think Calvin Ridley overtakes Christian Kirk as the alpha in this offense immediately. They're two different players. Christian Kirk will play the slot. Calvin Ridley is an 80 to 85% outside guy. Trevor Lawrence wants to strike the ball down the field, and Calvin Ridley becomes that guy. You know, obviously, it, the target share is going to be a little weird now, but even, like, dudes like Marvin Jones are out of there, and you say, like, oh, Marvin Jones, whatever, but he had upwards of 80 targets last year, okay? So this is not going to be a problem for Calvin Ridley to eat in this offense. I love Calvin Ridley. He's a bounce-back player. He is someone that you should absolutely not be overlooking in fantasy football this year and staying in Florida one of my favorite QB values in all of fantasy football is Tua down in Miami, all right? Now, 
why your league mates will forget about him. One, all the concussion issues. I get it. He had two concussions last year, possibly a third. Uh, Kenny Pickett had two the year before that. Two was, yeah, I understand. They were probably on a different level. He missed a bunch of time. I don't think people actually understand just how good he was when he was on the field, though. I don't really want to read this entire tweet off to you guys, but we'll throw the screenshot up on the screen, and it is actually insane, the rankings that he had. So if you're listening via podcast, there are about 15 to 16 of the top QB statistics, like the top categories, and Tua pretty much ranks top five in almost all of them. All right, fuck it. Since you guys asked and you're insisting that I read the damn list, yards per attempt, adjusted yards per attempt, deep ball completion rate, accuracy rating versus man, passer rating versus man, red zone completion rate, red zone accuracy, accuracy rating versus zone, QBR, air yards per pass attempt, passer rating versus – it's all the all those sat, the, all those categories that I just listed off for you, and there are more. There are plenty more than that. He was top three among NFL quarterbacks last year, and I think that people think because – McDaniel came over from the San Francisco offense that is highly efficient on the ground, that Miami is a run-heavy offense. It's not. They had the seventh highest passer rating in the NFL last year. Not passer rating, but rate of plays that were passes, like the percentage of their plays that were passes. Seventh highest rate in the NFL last year, 62%, which is a high number. And in games where Tua was actually healthy and the starting quarterback there, that number shoots up to 63.5%. Tyreek Hill and Jalen Waddell are goaded. If he doesn't die, Tua is going to the sky. That doesn't make sense because he's going to the sky one way or another, right? So I absolutely love Tua this year. Tyler Lockett, man, wide receiver, Seattle Seahawks. He is the third player up on this list. Tyler Lockett is like packing toothpaste for your vacation. You know what I mean? Like everybody just forgets. But the one time that you remember, the one time you remember to pack it, the one time you remember to draft Tyler Lockett, you're like, holy shit. This was really, really nice to have it in my bag. This is really nice to just be able to throw into my lineup. You know what I mean? We're calling him Tyler Toothpaste from now on. And and I think the reason that people forget about him is, one, he, obviously he's like an underwhelming-ish type of player. He's not always making gigantic plays. You have DK Metcalf, who's like the human highlight reel over there. But more importantly, they do draft Jackson Smith and Jigba in the first round. So everybody's hyped up about these. I've done a ton of underdog drafts, and I would say it's probably like 50-50 where JSN actually goes above Tyler Lockett, which I can like kind of understand in a tournament play where you need high upside at the end of the year, like those weeks 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. You need guys with explosion rates and a lot of times rookies towards the end of the year end up having like big breakouts you know in those last six weeks so that's kind of understandable but Tyler Lockett four straight thousand yard seasons five straight seasons of eight plus touchdowns you don't think of Tyler Lockett as his big touchdown scorer but he's been arguably the most consistent touchdown scorer probably out of outside of like Devontae Adams at the wide receiver position in all of football over the last half decade he has been a top 15 fantasy wide receiver in half PPR in all five of those seasons, just I'll just take it back. Starting last year, 2022, and working back to 2018, he was the wide receiver 13, the wide receiver 13, the wide receiver 8, the wide receiver 14, the wide receiver 15. And now he's getting drafted as like the wide receiver 30, 31, 32 in best ball drafts on underdog right now. It's insane. If you go look at player profile or his profile on there, he was number five in win rate versus man coverage. The man is still really, really good. He never, ever misses time because he doesn't let people hit him. So his old age, I don't think is going to slow him down, at least not anytime soon. We saw Geno Smith just excel as their quarterback. I'm expecting bigger, better, brighter, more awesome things for this entire offense Tyler Lockett yeah maybe he doesn't go for 1300 yards but I feel really confident he's going to finish somewhere from like the seven to nine touchdown range and have 950 to 1050 yards 60 to 70 catches I'll take that all day at wide receiver 30 your league mates overlooking him they're all hyped about Jackson Smith and Jigba fuck Jackson Smith and Jigba I didn't mean that kind of did I think Sky Moore number four Ooh, that was nice Sky Moore number four why will your league mates overlook him because his rookie year was terrible. However, I still believe Sky Moore is the same player he was in college. And if you guys read any of Matt Harmon's work on reception perception, which is absolutely a product slash service worth purchasing, he routes all of the uh, receiver routes and basically tells you how successful a receiver was versus man zone press coverage in terms of percentiles. It makes it easily consumable for someone who's really dumb like me. You just look at the charts and you're like, this guy's good. This guy's not good. Sky Moore was awesome coming out of college last year. He didn't play great, but his percentiles were good enough that I still have a lot of like a lot of players score way worse than what Sky Moore did last year. And I'm not shocked that he comes from a smaller school, a non-Power 5 conference school, and it might take him a minute to acclimate to NFL speed, 
We see that pretty often. It's easier to go from SEC to the NFL because you're playing against a lot of NFL players. It's a lot harder to go from Western Michigan stepping onto an NFL football field and being problematic for the defenses as soon as you get onto the field. It's usually just not how it works. Use a little common sense here. And this is a quote directly from his profile on Reception Perception. He said, Sky Moore was targeted on 27.7% of his routes sampled, which puts him in the same company as names like Chris Olave and DJ Moore. Let's not forget, he was a second round pick for the Kansas City Chiefs. They got rid of Juju Smith-Schuster. They got rid of Miko Hardman. That does not mean he's going to be the alpha there, but it does mean the target totem pole is completely up for grabs there. Kadarius Tony has never proven to be able to be an alpha slash stay on the field. You have Rashi Rice, who's a rookie. Sky Moore is almost like a fucking veteran in this wide receiver group at this point. MVS has proven that he can't actually prove anything. So I think by the end of the year, Sky Moore will be at worst, the wide receiver two in this offense, and he's like the wide receiver 57 right now in fantasy. Number five on this list, and make sure if you're enjoying the video, you hit the button down there that looks like this, and then you put the D in the subscribe button, all right, because we are doing part two of this exact video on Friday. Gerald Everett is the first tight end on this list, okay? Los Angeles Chargers guy, of course. The reason that most people forget about him now is because he was so overhyped coming into last year, and then relatively disappointed so no one wants to dip back into that pool all right we've kind of been fooled by the Gerald Everett storyline narrative quite a few times at this point right it, it, it was cute when he was like 23 24 25 he keeps saying oh he's so athletic he's eventually going to break out he's 29 now but the reason I'm excited about Gerald Everett this year is because Kellen Moore the offensive coordinator from Dallas is coming over to the Chargers and he is always always in his stint there in Dallas gotten his tight ends to produce in fantasy if you look at the yearly ranks under Kellen Moore in Dallas, 2019, he had the tight end 11, which was a 37-year-old Jason Witten. 2020, he had the tight end 11. 2021, he had the tight end 3. Last year, the tight end 10. Zero finishes outside of the tight end 1 range. And I would argue Gerald Everett's about just about as good as any of the tight ends that Kellen Moore was working with during that time span. And shout out to Jam Jameson for the research and the stats on that one. Last year, Gerald Everett finished as the tight end 15 overall in fantasy while playing just 15 games. He was number nine in targets, number eight in catches, number 11 in yards, and believe it or not, set a career high across the board in most of those categories and in fantasy points per game. And this does not even include the playoff game where he went six for 109 and a touchdown against Jacksonville. Last year, he was number five in red zone targets among tight ends. I think you could do worse than... A uh, super athletic tight end who was number eight in yards after the catch, number six in contested catch rate. And despite having Justin Herbert throwing him the ball, his target quality rating per player profiler ranked 30th among tight ends last year. A little bit of luck, a little more accuracy his way, and those receptions, those, those receiving yards, everything's getting a little bit of an uptick there. So he's all right in my book. He's a tight end 18 right now. The last guy up on this list, another late round tight end, probably going a little bit after Gerald Everett, is Tyler Higby of the Los Angeles Rams. I get it. No one wants anything to do with this passing offense outside of Cooper Cup. But man, if you look at his like participation in the offense last year, targets, target share, target rate, snap share, slots, uh, maybe not slot snaps, but routes run, route participation, all pretty much top five, top eight, top nine, top 10 amongst tight ends last year. Number seven in red zone targets, despite having a shit offense. Number five overall in receptions. Number nine in receiving yards. Number five in yards after the catch among tight ends, man. His expected fantasy points per game last year, tight end seven. Okay, and I get it. Like, I, it's not a good thing that you underperform that. But I think with Matt Stafford, if he's fully healthy, you're getting a dude who's just going to get a shitload of volume. It's almost like it's almost like uh, I kind of like Hayden Hurst as like a super deep tight end this year, just because he's going to play on 90 percent of the snaps. And there's not anyone else really taking opportunity in that offense that we know of yet because Bryce Young hasn't built that chemistry yet. He feels like the Los Angeles version of Hayden Hurst, but better because he already has chemistry with Matt Stafford. It's literally Cooper Cup and then Tyler Higby. Behind him, I mean, you could fucking yell all you want about Van Jefferson and fucking Tutu Atwell and Puka Nakua. Like all those guys, sure, maybe they do something this year, but we know Tyler Higby is going to be the guy running the routes and probably getting a ton of targets. So I don't think, and I don't think a ton of people realize this, but in half PPR last year, Tyler Higby actually finished as the tight end nine overall he was a tight end 14 in 2021 he was a tight end 19 in 2020 they still had Robert Woods Josh Reynolds Gerald Everett was still there he was a tight end 8 in 2019 so him dropping all the way down the tight end rankings makes me a bit intrigued as long as Matt Stafford continues to have healthy reports come out of camp that he is fully healthy 
and it looks like he'll be the starter and they're not trading him. Nothing like that. If it's Stafford on the field, I want a little bit of exposure to Tyler Higby and you should too, while your league mates will not be looking for him. All right. So that is six players that your idiot league mates will be overlooking in fantasy this year. Make sure you subscribe because we have part two on Friday. And if you want another video like this, we have a video that we already posted eight players to let your idiot league mates draft all right so let them overlook these dudes draft them but we also have a list of eight players that you should let your idiot league mates draft all right so go watch that video we'll put it on the end screen we'll link it down below i love y'all and we'll see you tomorrow with one of the noah's videos i believe